Dear subscribers, as you know, we shared many information for you, and we are studying very hard to find current news for you. However, I cannot use this channel for future. Please follow our new channel called As Daily News Report and watch our video to support us. Link in description. Also, you can reach the video we shared on Daily News Report by clicking on the top right button. We highly recommend watching, subscribing and sharing. We will continue to share some news on this channel where we take precautions against some situations for future. Thank you for supporting us. Is moving in military assets. Where do you think this is all going to go and where do you think it's going to end up here? Well, it could very well uh, continue to percolate and end up in World War III. There are a lot of forces lining up and basically choosing sides. Uh, the, the real wild card, of course, is Turkey. But um, there's a, really a, a mixed bag of uh, goals that people have. Uh, the, the various nation states uh, are either pro-ISIS or not, and they're either pro-Western or, or not. But some of the uh, countries that are anti-ISIS are also anti-Western. So you have kind of a, a, a conflicted cast of characters there. And it's, it'll be difficult to say exactly how it's going to play out. But needless to say, things are probably going to get worse before they get better. Now, we see... Russia moving in military assets, does this pose a problem for the United States? Not particularly per se. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, um, of course, anytime you have a major influx of arms to an area, it can shift balances of power. And I think the Russians, um, when you come right down to it, have a long term goal of containing radical Islamic uh, growth, mm -hmm. uh, partly because of what's going on in the Stan countries, you know, the Kazakhstan and so forth. The Russians have a long-term strategic goal of containing the Islamic threat. Uh, there's a number of, th of things behind that. One is they only have a few warm water part ports. Um, and um, if they get out um, to get out into the Mediterranean, uh, they need to control those ports. And they're not even particularly good ports that they have right now. They, they're their long term goal, really, dating all the way back to the Tsarist days of Tsarist Russia, even mm -hmm. before the Soviet Union, has is to have several good warm water ports. Uh, and. The, the Russians never lose sight of that long-term strategic goal. And they have, over the years, uh, especially back during the days of the Soviet Union, uh, shown a willingness to support various groups if it plays into their long-term goals. And if you look at what's going on in the Ukraine right now, if you look at what's going on in the stands, if you look at what's going on in Syria, the the Russians are are going to do what they believe is in their best interest in the long term comes comes right down to it and and that and their whole intelligence apparatus which started out with the NKVD and then became the KGB and uh, now is uh, going by a different moniker mm -hmm. um, all of their intelligence apparatus all of their military force all of their political maneuvering, all their diplomacy, all plays into that long-term goal. Now, we see, I mean, fighting pretty much around the world. I mean, we see it in Africa. We see it in the Middle East. We see it up in Eastern Europe and Ukraine. And we see, you know, the U.S. containing China in the Pacific and Lately, we've seen strange things in China where we've seen what maybe three chemical plant explosions at this time. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing 
the Chinese stock market continually taking a dive. Um, of course, the corporate media is out there blaming everything on China. It's all China's fault about it. Pretty much everything that's been happening. And we're seeing here in the United States um, the stock market fluctuating. I mean, do you think the three chemical plants were a coincidence? That, that could have been a coincidence. Um, it's really hard to say. Uh, it may be just evidence that um, one or more industries may have been ramping up quicker than they should have, and they left safety considerations behind. And let's face it, uh, Chinese safety standards are not like they are in the West. This is not the first time they've had major accidents or, or major spills, for example. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I'm not, I don't take a conspiratorial view that um, those three explosions ha were um, evidence of some machinations against Chinese expansion, for example. Uh, more likely, it was just a, a, a case of um, moving too quickly uh, down the road to um, large-scale production industrialization. So, um, but to get back to this whole strategic thing, mm -hmm. I do believe that the, uh, the, one of the long-term threats to the United States will be China. And it, it's the second largest economy in the world. And eventually, the two biggest kids on the block are going to have a fight. It's just human nature. Right. So... Uh, as I pointed out in my novel Liberators, there is the potential in the long term, even for Chinese uh, expansion, territorial expansion, not just Taiwan, but um, they could have much larger goals reaching across the Pacific. And I think particularly in the long term, I'm talking 75, 100 years, they may be looking at Africa and they may be looking at Australia in particular as um, uh, strategic places that they need to expand ter territorially to secure the raw materials they need to keep their industrial society going. Yeah, and we actually see that today. We see China has uh, made a lot of bilateral trade deals around the world and also a lot of deals in Africa um, where they're pouring in billions of uh, dollars into Africa to build their infrastructure right. and to you know get to those natural resources. And we're seeing that a lot today. And lately, I mean, we've seen the economies, I mean, not just in China, but throughout Europe and the United States, really starting to break down at this point. I mean, mm -hmm. we're seeing the stock market fluctuate up and down. I mean, it reminds me of 2008, 2001, and 1929 in the summer when we had the market fluctuate up and down. I mean, do you see right now problems in the economy? Do you see oh, that we're headed towards something terrible? I, mean, I, I think so. Uh, you know, we, ha we have really the empty shell of an economy in the United States. Our industrial base is essentially gone. Uh, we've transitioned into more or less a service economy. We've built up mountains of mountains of debt, uh, both uh, consumer debt and um, sovereign debt, nation state debt. And eventually those debts are going to have to be repaid. So I, I think that inevitably there's going to be a major economic break that takes place. But I wouldn't put it past the powers that be to uh, continue uh, pushing the economy along, kicking the can down the street, as they say in the modern parlance, uh, as long as they possibly can, uh, possibly past the next presidential election before they let things fall apart. But at some, time, at some point, they're going to have to fall apart because uh, for, for many years, they've had the policy of ZERP, the zero interest rate mm -hmm. policy. And ZERP is about as an artificial and economic environment as you can get. It, it borders on Mussolini style economics. And you can't maintain ZERP indefinitely. And if and when the interest rates do turn, and they will, I believe, we're going to see 
a massive contraction in the U.S. economy. You'll see massive layoffs. You'll see a sharp, sharp decline in equities. You'll see uh, huge fluctuations in the bond market. And uh, one thing that most people discount, but they really should be looking at very closely, are derivatives. Uh, the majority of the derivatives that are in play right now are actually interest rate swaps. And the the way the derivatives market has built up in the last few years, it's all predicated upon minute changes in interest rates. We're talking just a couple of basis points is, is the way they're making their money right now and, and hedging their bets. If there were a large swing in interest rates, I think it would catch the derivatives market um, by surprise, they could get absolutely blindsided. There could be huge losses, and the counterparty risk is tremendous. Abs uh, people have no concept of the implications of a large swing in interest rates imploding the derivatives market. And if and when that happens, it could be very, very ugly. The counterparty risk is huge, and the greatest risk, of course, is that you have a missing counterparty. It, uh, you know, the derivatives market, in essence, is a is a pretty wise thing. It's hedging your it's hedging your bets. It's it's mitigating your risk. But it's a it, and normally it operates in such a way that it all ends up as a zero sum game. But if you have a counterparty that disappears, you have you're, you're basically left holding the bag, and to the tune of not billions but even trillions of dollars are in play right now, and the risk is tremendous. So I mean, we hear the Fed talking about raising interest rates, you know, sometimes this fall. I mean, they keep changing when they're going to do this. Do you think they're actually going to raise the interest rates? They could incrementally, but I think what is more likely to happen is they'll raise rates briefly. The economy will go into a stall, and then they'll they'll backpedal and they'll go back to zero. Won't that have an effect on the markets? And oh yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, people are going to say, "Okay, you tried it, you brought the interest rates up, it didn't work." So and, and everyone will re will see that they backed themselves into a corner and they have nowhere to go but zero. So. I mean, at, at this point, when they do this, this is, I mean, their credibility at that point in time, if they yeah. actually go ahead and do this, goes to zero. Right. Their, their credibility will be shot. Yeah. And uh, and it won't be just credibility in the American equities market. It won't be quite credibility in U.S. Treasury paper, but the, it may be credibility of the dollar as a currency unit. The dollar itself may lose credibility. Right now, we're in a, in a kind of an odd situation where there have been all this turmoil in the eurozone, and the U.S. is actually seen as a relative safe haven. And one of the things that's keeping the dollar strong right now and keeping the American equities market up is a massive influx of money coming in from Europe uh, because they don't consider the European markets to be safe or even the euro as a currency unit to be safe. But that can't go on forever either. At some point, all confidence is going to be lost in the dollar. And when that happens, watch out. It could be very, very ugly. Now, I, I wanted to talk to you about cyber attacks, cyber espionage. I mean, we hear a lot of things in the corporate media, alternative media about, you know, cyber 9-11, cyber, cyber Pearl Harbors. Uh, we're seeing NORAD. They decided to refurbish Cheyenne Mountain and they're moving back in. The stock right. exchange decided to create a disaster site in Chicago. And, you know, the the U.S. government is actually pointing fingers at China, could be sanctioning them, pointing their fingers at Russia, North Korea. I mean, what do you see coming? Do you see a cyber Pearl Harbor, cyber 9-11 coming? There very well could be. And if you look at uh, the map of uh, cyber attacks that goes on every day, and there's actually a live map that you can – that you can find. Um, it was linked to in my blog um, a few weeks ago. 
the majority of those attacks are coming out of China. And those are really, when you come right down to it, just test attacks. That's not the, the, the main event. That is, those are just probing for vulnerabilities. And we actually have vulnerabilities in at least three distinct areas. First, we have the vulnerability to viruses and trojans and backdoors. Uh, secondarily, we have the vulnerability to EMP. And uh, thirdly, we have a vulnerability to solar flares. So uh, even if some malicious hacker or hacker group or nation state that hires a bunch of hackers doesn't do it, do in the system, our own son may do in the system uh, simply with another Carrington event scale solar flare, an X-class solar flare. So th there's huge vulnerabilities. Um, just to bring your readers up to speed, um, the, the vulnerabilities that exist are not just in the financial markets, but they're also in our physical infrastructure, in our water system, our natural gas pipelines, our oil refineries, our hydroelectric dams, our whole system of electrical power distribution all the way from the, the producing plants all the way to your individual power meter, they're all vulnerable to attack. What's happened is um, back in the 1950s and the 1960s, when they first automated these systems, they didn't even envision hacking. Mm. And the systems that they developed were originally standalone systems. Um, and the, the blanket term for this is SCADA, which stands for System Control and Data Acquisition. The SCADA software that they started building was fairly rudimentary at first. It was standalone. Uh, it could only be changed by uh, logging into the system itself and making changes on site. Then they added a dial-up modem layer of communications to that system. And then eventually they added a internet access uh, layer of communications to those systems. But the original software that was developed still exists, and it in itself is not very robust in terms of uh, vulnerability to hacker attacks. And the communications layers that they added on top have their own vulnerabilities. And it doesn't take much to absolutely destroy these systems. Uh, a lot of these SCADA systems, for example, control um, solenoid-type valves on systems. And a hacker could simply write a piece of code that would cause a valve to open or open and close at the wrong times or open and close repeatedly. And the next thing you know, you have burst pipelines everywhere. And we're talking water pipelines, natural gas pipelines, oil transit pipelines, uh, the, the pipelines inside of refineries. Boy, talk about a huge vulnerability. And, and the electrical power grid itself has its own vulnerabilities. It could all be taken offline, again, with a hacker attack. And it could take days, weeks, or even months to pick up the pieces. And I mean, I remember I was in uh, Manhattan in 2003 when we had the East Coast uh, blackout. And that was actually a scary situation, having no power whatsoever and being in a city where it was completely dark. Right. Um, I mean, at that point in time, people were very friendly. Um, people were getting along. There, there were really no problems that I saw when I was there. But just having that feeling of being in the dark in a city, and if I think if it lasted more than uh, the two days that I was there, I, I think things have things would have gotten out of hand uh, as yes, time went they very, on. They very well could have. Um, most people don't realize it, but we have a society that has become very technologically dependent and interdependent, interdependent uh, so that we really can't revert to 1950s levels of technology. I often have people say, well, you know, if, if, the, if the system collapses, people could just go back to running a manual till to run their stores. Mm -hmm. Well, that's just not going to happen. 
because not only do the stores use automated ordering systems for restocking, but the freight transit systems, all the trucking companies and train companies use automation for moving those goods. And the stores themselves are now built in these big concrete slab tilt up architecture boxes, the big boxes uh, that are windowless. So even if they wanted to revert to 1950s technology, they really couldn't because your average store is either going to be sweltering in the summer or freezing in the winter because it's, it doesn't have windows that can open. They're, it's, they're all sealed buildings effectively, except for the front door. And there's not going to be any natural daylight available to do business anyway. Right. So we've built, really built ourselves a house of cards. And if the power grids go down, all bets are off. There's actually three grids in the United States. There's an eastern grid, a western grid, and a Texas grid. And if any of those go down for an extended period of time, I would not want to be in a major city three days later. It now, will not be a safe place to be. Now, those grids, they're not interconnected. They, they're standalone grids? They're standalone right now, but there's actually a major project that's in the works. If you go to the Electrical Power Research Institute website, EPRI, you'll see that there's a grid intertie project that's being worked on right now that's effectively going to turn all three American grids into one big grid. So now not only <laughs> we'll actually have the opportunity for all three to go down simultaneously, even better. <laughs> wow. And and, and one of the things I pointed out in my blog is that um, in regions where power is actually produced, like the Pacific Northwest or the Four Corners region of uh, down where New Mexico and Arizona and Colorado come together, um, there's in those regions, they have the opportunity to island their power. And local power will be reconstituted in those regions very quickly. The rest of the grid may be down for a very lengthy period of time. And as I pointed out in my novel Survivors, it actually takes power to get the grid back online. It takes outside power to restart most power plants. Most people don't realize that. Hmm. Now, if there was some type of attack on the system, on the infrastructure, uh, I guess they can take down certain sections um, since they're not connected right now. Um, but you don't, at this point in time, do you think it's possible to take down all of them at the same time? Yes, if, if it's planned in advance and they have malicious code that they have ready to inject into those SCADA systems, they could very well time it so they could simultaneously bring down all three grids and even the Hawaii grid, um, which is independent, of course, mm -hmm. um, they could all be taken down simultaneously with enough planning. And one of the hallmarks of Islamic terrorism is simultaneous attacks. If you look at 9-11, um, it doesn't take a tremendous amount of sophistication to synchronize your watches. Mm -hmm. So what about hitting the financial area with a cyber attack? I mean, what would happen in that type of scenario? Well, it's hard to say how successful they would be, um, but based on the probing attacks that we've seen, I think it's it's safe to assume they could they could bring the financial markets and uh, one crucial thing would, of course, be the check clearing and the SWIFT system. If they could bring those all down uh, simultaneously and, and keep them down for several days, we could see some serious chaos. And it would most likely destroy the economy at that point. Well, yes. Um, even, even if the markets reopen a few days later, the level of confidence that will exist will be weak at best. So uh, just the psychological impact of the knowledge that they, that they were able to do this mm -hmm. will shake the confidence of American investors to the core. And they will, I think, vet both uh, institutional money managers and individual investors are going to very quickly think about reordering their investment portfolio, portfolio. and it, things are going to look very widows and orphans very quickly. Hmm. Um, people are going to 
want to minimize their risk. They'll want to um, get into tangibles. They'll want to focus on stocks uh, that have inherent value, not just cyber value. So um, I would not want to be uh, on the board of directors of Yahoo or Google or Facebook when all this happens. Uh, I would much rather be on the board of um, General Mills or Coleman Industries hmm. because I think that's where people are going to be putting their money into companies that actually produce tangible products that consumers are going to need no matter what. Those are going to be the new widows and orphans kind of stocks. Hmm. So let, let, let's just do this. If there... I mean, we're both agreeing that there is some type of collapse going to come. We just don't know when. Right. But how do you think this will unfold? Well, I mean, what pe what will people experience during a collapse situation? Well, if it's a full scale collapse and the grids stay down for an extended period, it could look a lot like my novel Patriots, where the grids go down and essentially don't come back up. And when that happens the cities become untenable very quickly because of the long chains of supply, the, the population density, the lack of sanitation, because, uh, you know, the, the power goes off for two or three days. That means the water's going to go off too, because mm. um, most people, most people don't realize it, but we no longer have many gravity fed wa civic water systems in the United States. Uh, in the old days, probably 20 or 30 percent of the systems were gravity fed from end to end. They'd start out way up in the mountains and then they have gravity flow all the way down to the city. And um, the, if the power grid went down, it would have made, a, made a, a, a difference. But now we have systems that have pumps everywhere. And we're, especially in places like the Midwest, where you're pumping water up to these, these gravity tanks and then you have gravity flow back down. But even in the systems that were previously gravity flow from end to end, they, because of the EPA's standards on water clarity, they have these what they call turbidity standards for the water, they require all the water to be pumped through filtration systems. And they have physically set up these systems where the the water has to, they can't bypass the pumps and the filters. The, the water systems are set up with, with the assumption that the grid power will always be there or will, or will be shortly be re restored if there's an outage. So even if they wanted to, they couldn't revert to gravity flow from end to end, um, not without a lot of physical rework of, we're talking some really large pipes. We're talking 20, 24 inch diameter pipes. Um, you don't just switch those around in, in a matter of a day or two. So when the power grids go down, the water system will go down. When the water system goes down, people will not only not have drinking water, but their toilets won't flush, and it's going to be a public health nightmare. At least in third world countries, people have the common sense to, you know, dig outhouses and uh, not foul the water upstream from them. We have a very urbanized society that has basically no clue about how to live in third world living standards. And it's, it, again, it's going to be a public health nightmare. We're, we're going to see um, outbreaks of all sorts of diseases very quickly if we have a situation where the toilets aren't flushing. And uh, how are people going to get food, uh, drinking water? I mean, how are they going to survive through this? Well, in the big cities, a lot of them simply won't, especially in the Northeast, for example, where if this were to happen, say, in the fall or the winter, uh, by the next spring, you could see a 50 percent die off of the population. There's simply too many people in too little space who are too dependent on the system. And we, you have just a huge cascade of vulnerabilities that are, are going to come into play. You've got a huge number of people that are dependent upon medical oxygen and insulin and uh, CPAP machines and uh, heart medicines and uh, antipsychotic drugs and everything else. You've got the whole medical aspect. 
you've got the, the physical transport of food. And if that breaks down uh, for more than a week, most, pe- most families don't have more than three or four days worth of food on hand. So you're going to see massive rioting, looting going on in the big cities. And if the looting gets bad enough, the truckers won't feel safe even driving food into the cities. So the cities will effectively just implode. And when they do, that's going to mean huge outpourings of uh, refugees from the big cities into the into the larger countryside. And that's going to have a whole cascade of effects as well, all, all, of, all of its own, because you're, you're going to have, um, you know, it's the inverse square law. You've got that huge mass of population going out into the wider countryside and, and the suburbs are going to get hit first and then the countryside. And conceivably, we could see a complete breakdown of law and order and absolute chaos for an extended period of time until there is a, de- a die off of population. And that, that's what I described in my uh, novel Founders. Hmm. We, we could see a, a huge depopulation primarily in the cities. The safest, safest places are going to be in very rural food producing regions with independent power that are well removed from the major population centers. And that's one reason why I've encouraged all the readers of my blog to move to the inland Northwest because I, I consider it to be geographically the safest place to be in the event of a major socioeconomic collapse. Now, if this, when or when this does occur, uh, you talked about 50% of the population most likely will die. I mean, that sounds worse than a, a, a nuclear weapon. It is. Uh, it is because, as I mentioned before, we've built ourselves a house of cards. We have, we're so systems dependent that we literally cannot do business on more than just a face-to-face, neighbor-to-neighbor basis as a society without the power grids and without the Internet. So it, dur- so during this time, what is the government going to be doing? <laughs> the government <laughs> is scrambling around and forming committees, just like it always does. And it, they really won't be able to do much. It'll basically be like Hurricane Katrina on a grand scale. Um, if you look at the monumental level of incompetence that was displayed by FEMA and the other federal agencies with Hurricane Katrina 10 years ago, I think that's evident, and, and they really haven't improved that much since then. <laughs> um, I think that's evidence that if there's a nationwide disaster, they're going to be absolutely unable to cope. I, I often like to say that FEMA, instead of standing for Federal Emergency Emergency Management Administration, actually stands for foolishly expecting meaningful aid. We're <laughs> okay. not going to be able to get... Uh, much more than a little bit of bottled water and some MREs to a few population centers. Beyond that, everybody else is on their own. It's what I refer to as yo-yo time, which stands for you're on your own. I mean, do you think... That's why people, individual families need to be prepared by themselves. They can't depend on government. They need to work together with their neighbors and with me, perhaps with their church families and prepare on their own because... In the final analysis, you will be on your own. I mean, during this time, do you think the government will declare martial law? Oh, they can try, yes. Yeah, uh, to... they, they may declare it. But, um, in fact, a lot of the, the current talk that that's going on about Jade Helm and mm-hmm. about the, the, the possibility of a collapse in, in September or October, um, people banter around the term martial law without really thinking about what it would take to institute nationwide martial law. You would need a, a military force structure that's five or ten times the size of what we have a, and the cooperation of local and county state law enforcement. And that would probably have to be three or four times the size it is to actually institute martial law. with. The military forces that are available, I would say at most they could institute martial law in four or five major U.S. cities. Beyond that, there just isn't the the force structure available. 
So they may want martial law. They may want to try to shut down the interstate highways and, and leave them only open to the truckers, for example. But it's not going to happen. Mm. So let me ask you, what should people do right now to prepare for what is coming? Well, first they need to pray. They need to get right with God. I'm a Christian, <laughs> and I, I think that's very important. But beyond that, I think it's important that they they sit down and kind of make a list of lists. In fact, at my website, I've got a uh, a spreadsheet that people can click on in the left-hand bar titled List of Lists. People need to think about their own particular situations, their particular stage of life, and where, especially where they live geographically and in terms of climate, and plan accordingly. You know, the, the preparations that someone needs to make in Maine versus Florida are going to be radically different mm -hmm. in terms of how much fuel you need to store, cold weather clothing, all that sort of thing, and your expectations for gardening, whether or not you're going to need greenhouses, and so on. Uh, so you need to plan according to your climate, your own particular stage of life. If you need to be near a major medical center, obviously you're not going to move out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, but uh, you just need to sit down, dispassionately think about what are my highest priorities. Water should obviously be at the very top of the list. Every family needs to at least have a good quality water filter. Uh, because, again, there may, may be a, a public health crisis, and if you're going to be drawing water from open sources and your foolish neighbors are defecating in or near those open water sources, uh, you need to be able to treat that water so it'll be safe to drink. So how many weeks or days or months should someone have food? Uh, well, I, I always look at two years as the baseline. Uh, okay. For my own family, we actually have a five or six year supply, and that's not even including what our own garden produces and what we'll have from our livestock. We, we raise cattle and we have chickens and you know, the whole panoply. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's important that people have at least a two year supply of food on hand and have a plan for relocating in a hurry, uh, for bugging out, as we call it. Uh, so that you can basically beat the rush and get out of the big cities before all the freeways turn into permanent parking lots. Because once cars start to run out of gas, uh, there's going to be a, the world's largest traffic jam and it'll only eventually be cleared with, you know, heavy equipment. So you need to be ahead of that rush getting out of the big cities. You need to be pre-packed, ready to go, and you have to have a destination that's already stocked in advance because you're only going to have probably one trip out of town. You're not going to be able to go back for trip after trip, getting more clothes, more food, your gardening tools, um, all your supplies. They're going to have to be pre pre-positioned at your retreat site. So if, if you don't have country cousins, you need to get to know some country friends right away. Hmm. So do you think cash is important to have? On yeah, hand or gold yeah. and silver or any? Well, I'm a big believer in in both uh, small denomination pre-1965 U.S. silver coinage, dimes and quarters primarily, um, as a, a means of barter. I'm also a big believer in common caliber ammunition, which in a really worst case scenario, uh, people may not even be interested in silver coins. They're just going to want ammo. Right. And if you've got it in quantity and it's a, in a common caliber, uh, you, you basically can name your own price for whatever you want. You'll have the ultimate barter currency. So a weapon is something that you would recommend? Oh, absolutely. Yes, um, several. And the training to go with it. I've often been quoted as saying that owning a gun doesn't mo make anyone a shooter mm. any more than owning a surfboard makes someone a surfer. You sure. really need to to practice with your guns regularly and become truly proficient with them. And you need to stock up all, all, all the standard stuff. You'll need cleaning equipment. You'll need a few spare parts. You'll need lots of extra magazines. You'll need web gear to carry around those, those magazines. Yeah, it sounds a little bit road warrior, but mm -hmm. uh, when you come right down to it in an absolute uh, without rule of law situation, it may come down to that. And, it may come down to you and your gun to protect your family. And a lot of people will say, oh, well, that's that's not realistic. You know, they'll they'll just wait you out. They'll they'll um, they'll surround your house and they'll 
they'll wait until you have to come out and get firewood or whatever, and then they'll shoot you. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that your average looter is going to be much more pragmatic. If someone starts shooting back at them, they're going to go find someone easier to pick on because they're certainly not going to want to take casualties. There's, they're not going to want to take casualties when there's no medical care available. They're going to go pick on granny down the road. So all it's going to take is a few shots and they're going to move along. Uh, James, I really appreciate you coming on the X-22 Report Spotlight. Thank you very much and thank you for all this information. Well, thank you for having me on. Um, sorry to end up on such a heavy gloom and doom note, but if you look at the logical pro progression of things, right. an economic collapse has some really